All right, we are live. Hello, and welcome to the Able Contemporary Gallery. I'm Teresa Abel, and I'm joined this evening by Sandra Peterson. Sandra is our, currently our featured artist, and we're going to be discussing the work in her solo exhibition called Original Once. Um, Sandra uh, is joining me this evening, and tonight we will first watch a video walkthrough of her wonderful show, talk with her about her current work, and focus on a few paintings. We'll then discuss her art practice in general, followed by a question and answer period. If you're watching through Facebook Live, you're welcome to type questions in at any point, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end of the conversation. You can also watch through our website, ablecontemporary.com. This conversation will also be taped and it can be watched later through Facebook, and there will also be a direct link on our website. Sandra Peterson's home and studio are in the countryside outside of Mineral Point, Wisconsin. Admired for her unique mark making, daring and originality since she was a student, Peterson received her BFA at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire and won the Paulette Chandler Scholarship to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In 1996, she completed her MFA and was declared a painter of high achievement. In 2017, Peterson was awarded an Adolf and Esther Gottlieb Individual Support Grant. Able Contemporary Gallery is so excited to welcome her for her first solo show in the gallery. She's best known for her distinctive mark making in meditative paintings, examining the animal kingdom in the human imagination. Her work uses highly textured surfaces collapsing background and foreground into a complex multi-dimensional plane, merging her subject with its surroundings. Peterson connects with the long history of humans looking to animals for inspiration in portraying universal themes pertaining to politics, community, and the environment. Thank you, Sandy, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. So we're going to just start to talk a little bit um, over the end of this video. Um, okay. The show is fabulous. Thank you. And I think it represents, there's definitely new work, but it represents some work from a long period of time. Yeah. So, and some of it is paintings that you rework and rework. Right. From what I understand. Yes, I, I do that sometimes. And it, it's a matter of, having the work in front of me and then because day to day I'm a different person as we all are sometimes I'm like oh I could just risk this a little bit and try to get more and when you know when you change one thing on a painting the whole thing can shift so sometimes I do go back into work and you know trying to just get that little bit more so they can go on and on and other paintings um I don't do that and they are fine you know just in a shorter session yeah yeah well and all of that started to make me think about the title of the show which is original once right there's that too <laughs> so, so um i know we talked about that title but tell everyone watching a little bit about what that title means to you yeah and, and so it was interesting because i was thinking about the show and wanting to come up with a title and i don't typically put words in my work but as i you know stood back on one of the paintings and i just saw some of my marks and i'm like wow that kind of looks like letters what does it say and I'm like, original once, I'm, you know, I'm thinking that that's what <laughs> these marks were. So the painting sort of revealed this title, which I asked you about, and we explored that a bit more. But um, with our awareness with the planet and climate change, I was thinking that some of the animals are, you know, endangered. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so, what will we have left? Maybe just an image of, of the animals. Um, so that kind of supported my first thoughts on original ones. But then when I was talking with you, Teresa, we started exploring how much more open-ended yeah. that title is. Yeah. 
and maybe like you're saying, um, the work, um, you know, what every artist tries to do is is to be original, and and if, if that can happen just once, or you know, <laughs> we're all influenced yes. by each other, yeah. and yeah. but we do hope to be original. Right, and and it's like we're all part of this lineage of artists who've come before us. We can't not but bring our influences and the work that we love as artists with us and into exactly. our work. But we do hope for our own spin and our own take on that, and that becomes original. It, it does, and and then the well, I'm sure this title, you know, can be talked about a lot. Um, it's, it's kind of a fun title um, uh, because I've been, you know, I'm been doing it a while and you know I think there's some humor in it too where I want to say well maybe she was the original woman but you know what's happened yeah. you know so I love I love humor um as well and you know it's what we're all shooting for to to have a voice and say something with meaning and uh, yeah mm -hmm. Kind of dig in a little bit more on a few specific paintings. So the piece that we're looking at right now is called From the Land of the Sky Blue Water. And um, I know that you told me it's touching on a, a song, right? Right, yes. And then also um, references the work of Charles M. Russell. Right, I think there's always that open, okay. open frame. So there's a lot to talk about yeah. with this piece. So I guess I'm just going to get playing the genesis. Right. Well, you know, I think there, I was feeling like a lot of times the, the animals, and in this case, I have the, the female figure as well, but they're, they're on the edge of things, they're on the brink, they're on the edge, they're on a cliff looking out, they're a hillside, and Maybe running up against the end of the canvas as well to you know create maybe a, a tension point a little bit or just that at the end of the frame and utilizing you know that space. But I was thinking about the open plane and um, you know thinking a, a little bit about Charles M. Russell, uh, just you know how that space opens up. And I, I really love that. So, and then when I was working on this piece, the title from the land of Scrabbly Water just kept playing in my head, like, why, why am I <laughs> thinking about this? And I did a little bit of research. And um, so it's from a 1909 song. Um, and I have to reference the um, composer was Charles Wakefield Cadman. And then, um, the lyrics were by Nellie Richmond Eberhardt. So um, as a female um, lyricist back in the 1900s, um, that was you know, pretty cool to see that, that she's writing these lyrics. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the, the song, but I have to say how, what got me to that point was, okay, and I, I think say it was the commercial Kind of that would play in the what maybe six seventies seventies because I remember it. Yeah, so it's just a real. Um, so let's pull people in. So if you, I don't know if it's just a special thing. I think it was there was a beer company called Sam. Yeah, and when we grew up, they had this. They had made this song into a jingle for their beer commercial. Yes. And it had a cartoon bear. It had a cartoon bear, the hand bear. Yeah. yeah. And so it's a little bit embarrassing. Because, but there's something about the, the, the beat of that. And I'm like, well, there has to be a, a, a deeper meaning than just, you know, tying it to that. So then I was happy to find that there was there was another song. Um, that the beer commercial derived from. Um, and, you know, the song, the lyrics kind of speak of, of that time frame where, um, uh, you know, women are more captive, and, um, but yet they have a voice. And, um, and then I was thinking about, again, the, the uh, climate change and, and, you know, maybe we're all sort of 
you know, captive of, of our situation of improving. Yeah. So, you know, for me, when I when I'm painting and um, coming up with the metaphors within the work and also the titles, they have to kind of make sense to me, and then hopefully, you know, that can be explained out out into the, the world a little bit, or people make connections. But that's kind of how the title came to be. And then this piece um, is really a triptych. It is um, three uh, panels put together. We started off with the, the female on the far right, and then she just had a lot of presence, I thought, and a lot of power. So I felt like I could do more by learning and see what else. And then the, the center figure, I did necessarily want to repeat um, the female figure but and I painted her out and she just kept coming back so sometimes you have to you know accept that okay the painting wants to become this and and so that was repetitiveness I think in both the female and the animal itself can reinforce that um, power in um, you know the, the voice and the existence. So, um, and, and there's a strong horizontal pole, but then with the, that triptych, I tried to put these, the, the idea that the females are sort of, like if you see a, a card that has paper that, that is flipped up to create greater depth, um, like if we go to a tourist shop, sometimes we see these, these cards that are uh, like sort of going pop-up. Pop-up, pop yeah. 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 And I always love those, I mean, as an yeah. artist, so yes. clever and um, so some of those panels um, uh, it is what I'm trying to do with um, the, the female being there and, and having this kind of silhouette of a vertical pole in this vast big thing. Um, I find myself looking past you because that oh, is behind you, here. so I'm kind of looking that way. I also think it's interesting that um, this piece, because there's a repetition of the horse and the woman and the horse and the woman, there's a poetry to that or a musicality to that as well. Yes. And the fact that you based this on a song. Yes. And and it's very interesting. You know, for, for the um, speaking of, of music, I think a lot of the pieces for me, they're like little little notes or embellishments and then you know, and then you just stop in. And, and hone in, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on the blue point. And then, um, with the rest of the piece. Um, and it's to a um, reference of Charles and Russell there with that open expanse. Sorry, there's something weird going on with the audio. Oh. Is that view still okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's good. Okay, thank you, Sorry. Sorry, hope, hopefully we haven't uh, okay for people. Is that still all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Um, oh, so this is the Charles Russell painting, or a Charles Russell a, painting. Right, I wasn't necessarily thinking of, of this one or any one in particular, but there's that book um, and um, yeah, it was it was that feeling for me, you know, and then my style, you know, but that, um, you know, we were talking earlier, Teresa, about how these things that we're exposed to or, or just the experience and, and they show up, they're just in, in the ways of who we are. And um, so these references come up and kind of help solidify, you know, a direction with the painting. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so now we're going to talk about the painting that's behind us called Deer with Still Life, um, which is one of my favorite pieces in the show. Thank you. And if you can come and see the show in person, I mean, standing in front of this is, it's, it just, you get enveloped by the painting. It's real well painted. Thank you. Yeah, I was pleased with with this one. Um, the the larger paintings are, you know, a whole different ball game sometimes because 
Well, the, the brush to, to canvas ratio is so much different. Of course, I could increase, um, you know, and, and even all that out, but I don't, I don't plan that that much in advance. But um, sometimes in the work and and because it developed over time, I I started seeing, you know, what other shapes um, are in and around the figure, and I started thinking about the idea of still life and what that means in the history of art, because that goes back to what the 1500s and, and just giving a nod to, to the importance of still life, um, where the animals are, um, you know, there, there's more um, exterior where the still life will bring us to the interior. So I, I kind of thought that was interesting and important enough to um with some of the work i keep um playing on that, that theme a little bit yeah that other picture we were looking at was um lauren that's a piece by Cezanne. Mm -hmm. um, it's so lovely. yeah it is so lovely <laughs> <laughs> right um yeah so this history of still life right yeah yeah and i was reading a little bit about still life today and just um, even for the afterlife, and um, you know, some of the paintings were created to, um, you know, sort of pay homage to that that spirit or, or journey. Um, so, you know, just just a nod to um, just the, the whole history of, of still life, which is more fast than we have time for to talk about tonight i think but yeah <laughs> but that's <clears throat> that's kind of how that came about right um and then this is another of the large scale canvases um called what i want to be right so this piece um well, let me start with the title because I I think that um, you know we're we're always changing and maybe trying to go beyond or, or improve or I don't know if it's even improving but we keep changing um, who we are day to day I think I used to think it was every decade decades we had these fallouts of, of you know personal growth or something but like I think it just happens all the time <laughs> and um so this tiger in the picture is sort of standing in front of the the tree um this, this nature scene and <clears throat> the branches sort of come out as if you know maybe he wants to be or she wants to be I don't know an elk or a reindeer or something but oh. <laughs> you know so that's that's how the title came about um is it yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I just think this is a great example. I don't know if, if people can help on the screen, but there's sort of a mountainscape in the background. Yes. And in so many of the paintings we show, there is sometimes a more subtle or a more overt landscape in the piece as well as the animal, and they blend back and forth. So as the viewer, there's this push and pull between the animal and the landscape and they become one and i think this perfect example of that yeah exactly and i, I probably didn't say that because I, I do that all the time so just for me it's sort of second nature but yeah i pull the background right into the, the animal often and um and then with the working and reworking the textures get really built up this one this piece i just you know for for a period of time it was a horizontal piece and then you know now it's not it's vertical and this is you know this is what i um finally um you know came to completion with, with this piece um and then another theme is again um the animal on the edge of something where the tiger <clears throat> is you know there, there's a little bit of land there i think it might be cropped or maybe i'm not seeing the whole thing on the image here but and then the, the the water is at its feet as well. But sort of, you know, standing on that edge, just um, you know, not knowing maybe what what to come. Um, 
I feel like sometimes you also do these things in your community where there's little witty things that you do. Like in this one, the tail wraps around and reiterates the edge of the canvas. And I know sometimes you say they're up against it, like it's this tension, but in that case, it's almost like it's reminding you, hey, I'm just a painting. Right. That, yeah. That, you know, I'm within this canvas and this same thing and my tail has to do this. Right. It does. You're right. And and that is that is why, you know, sometimes they, they fit in the way they do because I'm, you know, I'm utilizing that space or sometimes if it's square um, composition and I'm putting an animal, it's like, how do you get this, this animal to fit within? You know, this one obviously has a little bit more space, but the animal is, is quite large. And it is painting. So, you know, I have kind of a raw um, gestural uh, style. And I feel like sometimes I say, well, it's just paint. I like, like, it's paint. So um, I'm just going to apply it <laughs> because, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to hide that at all. I'm not very good at hiding that. I just go for it. You know, my brushes can be held like this with a lot of heat. Rubbing, but just you know, like okay, you gotta you gotta feel it. I I if I don't know what to do, I okay, I just stick with you, you know, sort of center and like what happens is I just you know, it's just um, when I get frustrated, it's like okay, uh, take this and put it on the canvas yeah. without any explanation, just find it. Like find your way down discrimination and, and that's um, a thing with the enemy. The heads are sometimes down, pushing right. forward. And I think we all have to do that. And you know, this busy lifestyle, yeah. uh, we all just have to um, keep, you know, perseverance yeah. because if we, if we don't, it's like, not easy out there. <laughs> right, right. So yes, we are the animals. Um, no, that's great. So um, now we are looking at a painting by George Baselitz. And I know he is a German expressionist. Yeah. Well, I mean, he wasn't from the original period of German expressionism that a lot of us think about, but I think he's still considered a German expression. He, he is, yes. And so he's someone who was influential to you. Yeah, if I, yeah. If I had to say one one artist that I look to, um, it's George Boslitz or Baselitz. Thank you, um, yeah. Boslitz. Um, and I like that he can simplify. Even though I mean, he he he's so masterful in his mark making and um, his signature um, style is turning um, the, the images upside down to um, sort of um, uh, take away the artifice of, of, of painting. Um, but I like his very singular, or in this case, we're looking at um, the, the two figures, but just kind of keeping that open to letting you know, one one image and letting the, the paint around the images um, do what it's going to do and not getting too detailed. Yeah. Um, because with my mark making, that's, you know, I kind of have to rely on that as well. So Baslitz is, yeah, in my book, like right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think he should be flattered because your paintings are so outstanding. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you <laughs> should hear that. You <laughs> should. Um, I saw him once in New York. And, oh, you did. But I was too, too, uh, you know, like he didn't want to run up and. Right. You know. Yes. Um, but yeah. Fan. Be a fan. That yeah. That's very uncomfortable thing to do. But yeah. Um, so this is this is a smaller painting. Um, and I love the other thing is if you're just looking up on the screen, they're all so powerful. You can't tell if it's human scale or giant or if they're little. Yeah. They right. all have that same great energy. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. So Leopard with Stole um, is, is so beautiful. And this piece you said references a painting by Henry Matisse called The Green Stripe. Right. Um, so, well, what, you know, tell us about that piece and why, what it is about that Matisse painting that 
resonated with you? Well, too? I, you know, I play on the, there's different themes that I obviously that I rely on. I've talked about some, and then another is the vertical and horizontal pull. Um, well, I talked about that too, I guess. Um, but in in the green stripe, uh, Mat Matisse is using this, you know, division uh, in the portrait um, to describe form and shape and color. And um, with with my piece, um, I was noticing that there's a green stripe that goes horizontal. But then a lot of the the shapes in both of the pieces are very similar. So. I just like knowing, you know, that I didn't really set out to um, uh, pay homage to that uh, Matisse painting necessarily, but even down to the, what I'm calling the stole that wraps around the cat, you know, the, the V in the, um, in the neck line or some of the patterning as we see in her um, collar as well and the bun on her head um, with her hair, and then the, um, you know, the marks of the cat painting as well. There's just some similarities that I, I think are really interesting. And again, maybe it makes, it makes me think of, you know, just being aware of or exposed to um, certain artworks and certain um, you know, experiences that <clears throat> somehow they they are with us and they they surface again and you know it can be a really wonderful thing to just to, to see that show up. So yeah. Well, and in a lot of cases, I think the animals when they become a part of the landscape um, and the way you're painting them, they're the subject of the painting in a way that's different than this, where this seems like a portrait painting of a very specific cat. Right. Maybe it's just, I think it's the turn of the neck and it just is reminiscent of portrait paintings. It, it does, right. All the way down to like having a stole wrapped around, you know, and which are oftentimes the, the, the fur of the animal, you know, on a human, uh, unfortunately. But um, yeah, so some pieces, they come together really easily. This one did, it's just, I think this is when an artist gets away, uh, gets out of the way of themselves and it just like comes together, which is so uh, satisfying. And, and it's what I hope with every piece, you know, to just kind of like, okay, lose yourself in it. Um, yeah. And I think you touched you touched on something, well, probably a couple of times during this conversation. Um, I remember specifically when we were talking about the sky of the land, the land and the sky of the water. Um, at some point you mentioned having to let the painting become what it is. And, I, and right. I've talked to lots of artists who know about that during their process of making work. Um, but I feel like in your work that that is almost sort of easier or more important for you to allow the painting to become what it does. And because of that, I know we've talked that you will work on multiple, multiple pieces at the same time, right? And that's so true. you have this really, really cool studio out near Mineral Point, which is in an old historic church. church right. um, and so, you know, there's something, there is a lot of hard work being done in there, but for people thinking about the artist's lifestyle, it seems very romantic big old space and yeah. you've got all your paintings out right but I think there's a lot of time where you must just be sitting and studying and waiting for the painting to to figure out what's the right move yes and that's why um it's important at least for me and you know other artists obviously uh who work that way to have a number of pieces going because they they need the space I have to get away from them so that they can reveal themselves if I don't I can't see what's in front of me and I mean I think the exercise in, in in painting can be where what my brain is telling me and what's on the canvas are not matching and it's up to me to see what's in front of me not what I think I see and I think it's such a good metaphor for life I really go back to that a lot, like practice seeing what's in front of me, like just break it down and say, okay, this line is doing this, it's holding this shape, this color, 
And if you change it over here, it's going to do something else. And so in my brain might have this whole other like, you know, direction. We might be the same direction, but what's appearing isn't, it doesn't match exactly. I don't, for me, I don't know how it can. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can feel, I, I go maybe more if I feel. I'll, I'll do marks and just like if I'm working, I'll do marks in the air just to like, no, it's not like this. It's like this. Oh. It's like this. It's like, you know, and, and how much more can you, you know, it's like you're practicing a gesture. A gesture. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's part of how I work. Yeah. Yeah. I always feel like if, if, if your artwork, music would be, you know, jazz fusion or something. Which yeah. Is kind of like this foundation of, traditional skills but then it's all about being spontaneous or you know not spontaneous really but, but the movement in yeah, it yeah yeah the movement and letting it move and when it's not right um you know being confident enough to change it or, or willing to yeah. change it and so um this this conversation leads me to another thought about where we have to sort of learn as artists to get out of our own way, get out of our own heads and allow things right. to become what they are. Right. I think in the big picture too, as artists, we have to allow our work in general when we're developing our voice. Sometimes we, I think we have ideas as young artists, what kind of artists we want to be. Right. And it can be hard to figure out who we are and it takes time, but you kind of, again, have to get out of your way because you have a, so I guess what I, it makes me think when you were a young artist, when you decided you wanted to be an artist, and it was early on in the yeah. in high school. Yes, exactly. Did you have an idea of what kind of paintings you wanted to make, and was it anything like this? No, nothing like this. <laughs> the, the the path doesn't go straight. Um, so even in, in the style, nothing nothing like this at all. Um, I what what fascinates me about style is I think. And people tell me, oh, I can see you in the work. I can, every piece I can. And I, I, I think that's true with, with artists. You know, we, we meet people, we meet the artists and, and we can see how the work is similar. But what fascinates me is what if I can take that and push it out of the way and then what else shows up? Because I think I, it's, it's that um, getting out of the way idea. Like if I, if I take my, personality out of it um can another whole layer surface and then what what can that be i mean not that it not that the work doesn't have personality but i'm trying to find that in getting me out of the way so it maybe is a little bit harder concept but i don't want it to be so much about oh you know i know sandra and I can see her in every piece. I'd, I'd rather have the piece be something um, original once, you know, <laughs> like, like what would happen if I could lose me, push me aside and let, let that new whatever surface, which is me, it all, you know, it all right. comes back around. And that's why I noticed the change every, every day, because I'll make a new mark and I'll be like, I didn't do that yesterday. That's so interesting. Let's go and explore this a little bit. But then as I'm learning maybe a new mark, I'm, I might also be forgetting one that I used to be really right. good at. <laughs> I know there's a mark I did like 20 years ago. I'm going to get it back. But That's I can't, so I can't, it's like a gymnastics move, you know, like I can't do that, you know, triple whatever anymore. And I want to get it back. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been aware of your work for literally decades. I know, right. <laughs> um, but, and, and I think there's a thread through all of it, at least, you know, because I knew you when you were obviously um, a graphic figuring artist. out, well, yes, you were a graphic <laughs> artist. Was, yeah. um, but you were also painting and, I was as, also and getting, I think, getting your MFA. Yes, right. So, um, but there's that the thread of the work you were doing as a painter then that is still in the work now. So right. you're not, you can't lose that. And you can't lose it. Yeah. So yeah, so that's the beauty. You yeah. can you can keep making it malleable any way you want and any way that's um, you know stimulating to stay in it. But yeah, yeah, I'm I'm not gonna 
I mean, I kind of would like to, because I like, what would it look like if it was a different style? But it's, it's you yeah. know, that's the beauty of it, because right. it's locked into yeah. who I am. Yeah. Well, and then you're kind of fighting, you know, um, who you are, which is, doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you, um, but, but, it, but it would make sense, because you can't. Well, you're saying if you lost it, it wouldn't make any sense. Well, because it, I mean, I just think about all these young artists and all they're trying to do is find their voice and figure out who right. they are. Yeah. And I so, see. Right. so now you're, it's like you're in that sweet spot and you're just allowed to sort of play. Yeah. Within a mature style that you. Okay. So yeah, for like a, a younger artist, maybe, um, maybe don't you think that's the hardest thing to do is to sort of find your voice yeah it is it just takes time to yeah. to trust I think trusting that and and for me I can really describe it as, as you know like as a, a feeling and trust kind of go hand in hand right so so if you're a younger artist maybe that that's the idea of of you know that's what I mean, where it, it doesn't have to be the first thing that comes to mind, because I think sometimes the first thing might be, you know, we're being influenced by what we what we are exposed to. So, you know, maybe set that aside and then see what else could could serve us. It's just it's always an exploration. And then that style, I guess it just take it takes time, but so, you have it right away, right? I mean, that's what you're saying too, from yeah. knowing, like if we're talking about my work and we are, <laughs> you know, like you're saying, you saw that yes. way back when, yeah. even, yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm Yeah, no, no, that's great. <laughs> um, and now we're looking at, um, Sometimes I, I just call this one glue. Yeah. Isn't that what it's called? Yeah. Oh, okay. And it is. Well, yeah. And I've had other, you know, I just other titles, but because um, people see these as different types of animal figures, but I kind of just. Want... I have people call this, they say, oh, those horses. Sometimes people call them horses, sometimes people call them dogs. Mm -hmm. And I probably would call them deer, oh, <laughs> you know, but so, so but any of the yeah. above. So yeah. yeah, then I called it blue. Yeah, this is a beautiful painting. It's one of my favorites and has been for a while. Thank How many you. times have you reworked this painting? Well, I don't anymore because you- I told made, you not to. You told me not to um, a while ago. So I just, I just even though Thank I'd you. like to- Don't. Um, I, I don't. <laughs> yeah. But no, it, it took um, it took some time to get it to, to this point. It has a, um, you probably um, um, line, maybe can't, um, see it, but I I put a um, shellac on the on the blue, which gives it this um, kind of a, a patina look. But you know that was part of the uh, experimentation of of resolving it. So. Yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of painting under it, and then yeah. you sort of carved out the animal shapes. But when you were talking earlier about some of the pieces that we looked at where there's really much more of a push and pull with the landscape and the where there isn't such a direct horizon line right. or something. Um, do you paint a landscape first and then find the animal in it or? Other way is around, it, usually. Oh, yeah. interesting. Animal okay. and, then, and then work around, around that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, backgrounds have always been harder for me for some reason. So starting with, with an animal can just, um, give me that direction and then as I make my marks I can go in and out of the, the figure itself yeah 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 um, we are um Sandy and I are also joined here um by two other people this evening um Ann Arleski who's the gallery director and Lauren Miller who's the assistant gallery director thank you both for being here and running all the video stuff behind us um, so during this conversation, did either of you have any questions or any thoughts about things that Sandy and I talked about? Yeah, I was curious about the use of, um, you know, you're, you're using animals that I guess are more and, you know, typical to our world, you know, or our continent, um, 
the horses and the deer definitely more familiar. Uh, I'm curious if why the big cats. Um, yeah, I think I, um, you know, I, I paint a animals primarily. Um, that shifted over time too, but um, my, you know, my gestural brushstroke, and so the bigger animals just kind of receive that mark making really well. And then I give myself permission to um, paint, you know, cheetahs or elephants, even though I'm not looking at them in, in, you know, in real life every day, because we all, as children, you know, painted and drew anything, and we didn't need permission. So whenever I think about that, I just give myself permission. I'm like, well, you did it back then, and nobody said anything, so you, you know, so it's just simply that, and that just gives me the green light. And I don't really even know what they look like sometimes. And and if I don't know, and they're not showing up quite right on the canvas, it's where I take that you know torso kind of like whatever's here, and I just like you you know it's wrong, so find it. You know you don't have to see it, just find it, and and then redo the shape until it starts looking right. Well, and it seems like at some point too, you're probably like, it's a painting. Yeah, and I've, I've been more generous with <laughs> saying it doesn't have to look exact, like, like, you know, when you were saying the tail with the yeah. tiger over there, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's straight and running along that campus edge yeah. and it, yeah, it just becomes a beautiful, like, that's my favorite part of it. So I'll just say it's a beautiful part because it's yeah. my favorite part of that. Thanks. Um, that sort of ties into the question that I was thinking of, which is, do you come to your canvas with a with a plan of something you want to see, or is it completely spontaneous as you're working? Um, usually something in mind, and it can just change really quickly, and that might even mean rotating it side to side until I find it. But um, if it goes well, I have, you know, like I want to do a cat. And it's going to be, you know, um, sitting or standing or what, you know, like I'll just do the outline. I do like to, I don't always use a pencil to start, but it's really nice when, like if it's a new canvas, if, I, if I'm not reworking something, just a pencil, just a light line, because the pencil marks in the work later can be really beautiful too. But it, it grounds the painting in a way that the paint does, the paint is, so movable and if I just have a couple of guidelines you know it may be one gesture like da, 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 and then go for it yeah thanks Anne it's just such a great way to see how you work because I I have a very structured process and yours seems so much more kind of responsive as you're working and it's really lovely to see that comparison Oh yeah, and it, it is. You, uh, it is responsive. I, I'm just reacting. I'm it, it, again trying to see what's in front of me, see what I can keep, and change what you know, and just keep. I think of it like a volley sometimes. Like, okay, this is working. That's not this, you know. And that's when it's really fun. Have you ever lost a bit, like overdone, like, and then thought, oh, I, I painted over something really great, and I. I did. messed it up. I've done it a couple of times. <laughs> you think if I just did it once, I would learn, but um, um, I, I believe I got my um, individual support grant based on one that I painted over. Oh, I, I know. So it's a hard, hard, <laughs> hard reality. But having said that, um, you know, I, I couldn't see, you know, I have images. So I go back and I think, well, what was wrong with that? Or what was wrong with that one? And I'm still trying to learn that lesson, but I need more. Um, I need to let the paintings have more time to to sit and um, I don't know what what it's going to take because you know I'm working on a, a, a number of them and um, but I I keep doing it. It's just really has to stop, you know. But I, but but the other thing is I end up with. Uh, as we all know, it takes every mark making to get to the final, you know, where wherever it ends up. So I'm aware of that too. And, and paintings are as successful by reworking them as, you know, maybe 
three images back where I might have photographed and said, oh, well, that was fine, but it, it wasn't for some reason in, in, in that moment. So maybe some of the paintings are original three or four times. Oh gosh, yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop though. This is my, you know, I've said it on camera. I'm not, you know. But um, but I think it I think when you get too close to the work, um, it's it's harder to see it. And and it, all it takes is just set them aside and go on to the next one. And then you come back a week later, it's like, oh yeah, I know what to do with that one. And it goes well then yeah um are there any things in in your studio that you cannot work if you do not have um no not not really i mean i've worked as long as you have paint in a canvas and brushes yeah pretty pretty much um i heat the it's it looks more like a one-room schoolhouse and i heat the the studio with wood so i i really work to you know like if i want to paint i have to work but um but no i can i can just go at it if i have those basic basic things so do you find yourself doing more painting when it's warm out <laughs> <laughs> this year well yeah this year leading up to the show it, it it's it's interesting with the show because i um i painted the interior of the church and then um my daughter zula had um <laughs> jaw surgery in January. So everything leading up to this show did not put me in the church paint in my studio painting. Um, so that's interesting because you still have to make the show happen or and 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 it did, but you know there's something really rewarding about that on a really tough year where my studio wasn't up and running. And so I started painting in the house, but that's a whole different um, it's not like the studio because I, I don't have that rhythm of being walking up to the canvas and walking away, walking up and walking away. I tend to sit in the house now, like, you know, more. Oh, right. And so now I'll be able to get back in the studio because with my work in the, the scale of it, I have to do that. Right. And I kind of then, yeah. Well, and if you're living in your studio, which a lot of artists I have, lived in the yeah. room that I painted in. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't get away from it. Yeah. So either your life, right. your house interrupts your studio work or or all you do is work constantly and you can't stop picking away right at the painting. You'll, you know, I remember um when I lived with my husband Tim and I lived in Basco that's in an good. apartment where that's when we first met you. Yes. Because you were living in that same building at the time. Yes. And I painted in that main room and I could be sitting down reading a book in the living room or talking with Tim and I'd be staring at my painting on the easel and I'd get up and duel and Tim would go, what are you doing? Stop it. I know, because you can't yeah, get away. Can't get away. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it helps to get away. I think so too. I mean, if you can or put yeah. it, you know, put a sheet over it at night when <laughs> if it's in your house or, right. and it is, it's right now, it's all in, in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Your studios. So, um, so Lauren or Anne, I don't know if there's any other questions from either of you or anybody else. Great. No questions from the audience tonight. Hey, <laughs> well, um, again, for everybody watching, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the other, this show of Sandra's original ones will be in the gallery and available online and to see in person through April 10th, I believe, is that right? Um, the gallery is open Tuesdays through Sundays from 10 to 5. This uh, Talk with Sandy will be taped and will be available through Facebook. And there'll also be a link to it on the page for Sandy's show on our website, ablecontemporary.com. Um, we currently have two other shows happening in the gallery. One is a group show of ceramics called Functional Figurative. That show is also available online. And then in our upstairs space, number five, there's a wonderful printmaking show called Listening to Landscapes, um, featuring the work of Catherine Chauvin, Mary Hood, Tracy Templeton, and Rena Yoon. I curated that show with Mary Hood, and she will be here next week um, as part of the Southern Graphics Conference Council. Anne, help me. 
Southern Graphics Council Conference. Thank you, which is in Madison. And Mary will be here that Saturday, the 18th or 19th. I'm checking. Okay. Um, it's the 20th, I think. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Saturday the 20th, and she will be here from 1 to 3, I think, and giving a talk at 1 to 3. So that's everything, I think. And thank you to oh. you, Teresa, and Lauren, and Anne, and Elizabeth, who have worked so hard always. And yes, yeah. please come out and see the lovely gallery and yeah. your, your charming staff. I mean, you guys are wonderful. Thanks, Andy. The show looks outstanding in the space, thank and you. we're so proud of you. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.